Besides interplanetary combat, you can also directly invade. This works on the same principle, which means I'm still going to use the default tactics card, which uh, just so happens to be preemptive orbital bombardment. Many civilians will die, but that is a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Your chance of success depends entirely on whether or not you have replaced your troops with a mobile suit Gundam. Hi everyone, Shirtlight here. Do you like games that let you commit war crimes? Do you want to haul a big zap across the map on a single base jabber? Do you want the Gundam strategy which doesn't require as much micromanagement as Giron's Creed or Gashpons and G5, but you want something more complex than G-Generation? Well, you're in luck, since in this second part of the How to Get Into series I've picked just the game for you, SD Gundam G Next, a game that came out in 1995 on the SNES but it is quite easy to find and emulate even nowadays. It has elements of a conventional grid-based strategy while giving much more interactivity to the player during combat, allowing them to move units in real time. As some of you might point out, this is not the first game in its series, nor its genre, but in my opinion this is the most fun one. Besides, I made a proper translation for it a while ago, so I might as well give people an introduction to the game proper. You know the spiel. Sailing the Seven Seas is highly encouraged, so without further ado, let's get to the nitty gritty of it. To sum it up, regardless of the game mode you pick, you'll start with some units and some ships. However, the game doesn't tell you how controls work, so I'll try my best to explain it instead. In both the grid mode and combat, you move via the D-pad. The A and B buttons are used for selecting slash confirming selection and cancelling slash exiting menus respectively. As for the X button, it opens up your action menu, when outside of menus and actions. Tapping A lets you open up the details of a unit or a base your cursor is pointing at, while the B button lets you cycle between the Earth map, the Moon map and the secondary space map. Also yes, when pointing at the entry points of these maps, you can use the A button to access them. As far as the action menu is concerned, I've already explained it in the menu translation video for this game, so to save you time, I'm not going to retread the same ground. If you need to, pause this one and open that one in another tab. Don't worry, I won't go anywhere in the meantime. Same goes for setup menus. Suffice to say, the action menu lets you look up a whole lot of stuff, including the minimap version of the map, your own, points, units and all. On top of, you know, saving and passing turns. As for the rest of the buttons you have available on your SNES controller or its substitutes, the left bumper toggles the grid on and off, while the right one hides all the units on the map when held. Very useful if you need to see through the clutter. Lastly, the select button lets you cycle through all the units that you can move during turn, as well as your bases. Obviously, the start button is your usual menu-specific confirm button. Also, before I forget, in the setup menu you can use the X button to switch things in the opposite direction, which does save you a great deal of button meshing in order to get a specific thing. You can also use the left and right bumpers to cycle through the tabs in the setup menu. And sometimes you have to use the X button to confirm certain menu choices, but the game is usually nice enough to tell you about it when you have to, so there's that. At the start of the game, assuming you didn't run scenario mode, you can pick from 6 compound factions, or 12 separate factions, with the DLC adding a bonus one. Unless you know what you're doing, stick with the 6 faction mode. Because some factions have units only at specific tech levels, so you can probably guess that it's really easy to softlock yourself, should you for example run only the Zanscare or Shars Neo Zeon in early game. And yes, before you ask, you can pick multiple factions for your team's roster. Now with that out of the way, let's cover the 6 compound factions of the base game. I will cover the expansion pack's contents at a later point. The first faction is obviously the Earth Federation. It has the roster of the Federation from the original Mobile Suit Gundam, War in the Pocket, Stardust Memory, Shars Counterattack, and F91, on top of having Ayug and League Militaire rosters as well. They generally have very versatile units, on top of getting access to units with bombardment capabilities very early on. The Zeon faction, on the other hand, has the rosters of the original Principality of Zeon, the Dallas Fleet, and Shars Neo Zeon. Here's where you get a lot of generally cheap units that you can make copious amounts of, on top of having a much wider roster to pick from, allowing you to fill in a needed role at a moment's notice. You can also get a high-end Dolua class carrier ship during early to mid-game stages, costing whopping 58,000 gold, and sporting the carry capacity of 9 units, which is the highest one in the game. Third faction of the bunch are the Titans. These guys get the Titans units on top of Shirako's Jupiter Fleet mobile suits. There isn't much to be said about the bunch, apart from having very few early game units, meaning you'll have to stick with Gabaldis and Hyzax before you get the good stuff. 
Though I'd say one of the big highlights of the Titans is the fact that you can get the Jupiteris at level 30, which is literally a moving factory. Now for Haman's Neo Zeon. This faction only has the Axis units, but even so, it has a solid unit lineup. While not as outlandish in the roster size as its other Zeon counterpart, most of the units you get early on are basically mass-produced workhorse units, with the more high-end mobile suits such as Cubelay, Queen Mantha and Dovan Wolf coming in at mid to late game. Next up is the combined faction of Crossbone Vanguard and Zen Scare Empire, obviously composed of the unit rosters of their respective factions. Generally speaking, this faction has a smaller amount of units than the others, but at the same time most of the units you get are essentially more expensive high-end ground suits such as the Danon, Zone and the Zalo, offering less variety and less mass production potential in favor of higher performance. You also get a ship on wheels during the late game, which is pretty damn cool. Lastly, the game gives you the so-called Federation of Colony States, which is a faction with a super generic early game roster and a very snowball-oriented playstyle. You see, this one is very much a snowball-focused faction, which restricts your choice of mobile suits to a small assortment of gem variants, at least in the early game. Once you pass a certain amount of tech levels, however, you're giving the access to heavy-hitting units from G Gundam and Hero Yui's own Wing Gundam. The DLC does give you more of these, but you still have to work with GM-type jobbers until tech level 26, at least as far as your base roster is concerned. So, these are the factions. A good rule of thumb is picking one that either looks cool or supports your preferred playstyle. You can always just turn on the production mode if you want to pick and choose units manually, or just make an alliance with your buddy in a game with more than two teams in order to share units with one another. Speaking of units... For obvious reasons, the units do vary from faction to faction, so for the sake of brevity, I'll teach you how to read menus on top of explaining how certain ship units work, since there's some that are universal for every faction. Here's where I'll have to retread a thing from the menu guide. All of these have a handy little card where you can see a unit's name, cost, HP or energy if you prefer, the amount of tiles a unit can move each turn, the total amount of tiles the unit can move before needing a resupply, the amount of turns needed to make the unit, the amount of turns needed to resupply the unit, and the resupply point cost, which will be important later on. Now, the small icons right below indicate whether the unit can move in space, move on ground, move underwater, move in the air, capture strategic points, and the last icon, sometimes accompanied by a number, denotes whether a unit can bombard the enemy, and if so, what is the range of such an attack in tiles. Oh, and the text below is just flavor text. Though sometimes there's certain details to some units, like in the case of Zeta or the F91. The general rule of thumb is that mobile suits can capture points, while balls and mobile armors can't. With every mobile suit and mobile armor unit, you can also look up what attack and moves they have if you tap either the left or the right bumper. The black numbers represent ammo and the red numbers represent energy slash HP cost, since there are certain powerful attacks that drain HP instead. As for the ships, you get a similar display. You can find the name, cost, HP slash energy, movement points and so on in the same place, though this time the bombardment range is right below that, accompanied by the carry capacity. Now, the supply stat under that is fairly interesting. The number on the left denotes the amount of points it has for resupplying units within it. So for example, if I were to shove a gem into the white base, I'd spend exactly one point from its 32 point supply pool. In a similar way, the number on the right tells you how many times can the ship resupply and repair adjacent ship units. Some ships, like La Vie and Rose and Jupiteris, can do both. These stats are pretty useful for figuring out what is the strong suit of each ship. And of course, there's the small icons again, showing you whether a ship like that can move in space, on the moon and even on Earth. Outside of the production menu, the MS slash warship view from the action menu can let you look stats up as well, and you can use the left and right bumpers and the start buttons to navigate it. But only the production menu lists the actual attacks. So, each faction has a standard warship, some supply ships to top them off on top of an HLV and a subflight system. The last two are cheap, disposable ways to move units around. Each faction either gets the Shackles or the Type 89 base jabber, both being the Shark Scanner tag versions, by the way. You can put just about anything on a subflight system. Dendrobiums, Big Zams, Gun Tanks, Balls and Zacrellos included. Regardless, each can carry only a single unit. Although you can't attack until you get off of them, which obviously destroys the subflight system. These won't stop up or upgrade units, but you'll be able to move units around at no movement point cost of their own. 
which is a major plus, not to mention these work in just about every environment. Unfortunately, these won't let you travel between planets, slash moons and space like ships do. Which brings me to the HLVs. The HLVs, or for the uninitiated, the heavy lift vehicles, slash heavy lift vessels, are essentially disposable cargo capsules. You get to load up to 4 units into those, and then you get to launch them into space or drop them onto the planet. The moment you traverse between the two maps, the HLV becomes inert and once it's empty, it immediately disposes of itself. Though, as stated, it has to actually travel through maps for the self-destruction to take place. So don't worry about moving units in and out of it if need be. Both the HLVs and supply systems cannot resupply or upgrade units, by the way, so keep that in mind. As a fun piece of trivia, you can dock ships, HLVs and supply systems inside a base, even if they're full with the base itself giving resupplies and possible upgrades to everything inside. Use this fact as you see fit. SD Gundam GNX is pretty straightforward with the whole resource management thing. Definitely more so than some other strategy games. You basically have a single currency, gold. You use it for producing ships and units, with more gold generating each turn. To see how high your income is, it's right here, you can't miss it. Capturing more points on the map nets you a higher income per turn. Speaking of, let's cover these real quick. All of these can be taken over by moving a unit that can occupy points over them. Keep in mind though, if you're trying to occupy enemy spaces and turrets you might have to go through a combat minigame beforehand. Once taken, they are usually color coded. The most common type is the city. These have different appearances depending on where they are, but they essentially are the game's bottomless income generators. With each city held, giving you a 2500 gold bump to your income. Oddly enough, the close type colonies do not generate money, but can be used in other ways. Let's just say that they're movable, and can be weaponized. Upon breaching the atmosphere, the colony in question will destroy anything within a 6 tile radius of where it landed, turning the occupied structures back into neutral and changing the ground tiles within the explosion radius into a terrain type that slows down ground units. These colony drops can be expedited by attaching a rocket booster to them. The rocket boosters can be randomly found on neutral bases on Moon and on Earth, essentially doubling the speed at which the close type colony moves once you attach it to them. Depending on the map, there may also be turrets. If there's no unit standing on one, you can select it and bombard distant enemies at up to 4 tiles away. Should an enemy deplete its health bar during combat though, the turret switches to neutral until occupied again. The bases are useful for producing stuff and resupplying slash repairing units and ships without having to spend a single supply point. If you occupy an enemy base, you also get full access to their production and restock queue. Next to some of the ground and moon bases are points which the game calls airports. Once you have them, you can move a ship type unit or an HLV onto them and launch them into other space. As an aside, if you want to launch a ship that is on this tile without having to move off of it, just select move and then select the tile you're standing on in order for the launch option to pop up. Lastly, there's a colony laser, which can be captured, after which you can either move it around one tile at a time or have it charge over the span of three turns to unleash a devastating beam. Now, let's talk logistics, because this game has a bit of those. It's not super complex by any means, and I will try to be super brief about it, do not worry. First of all, there are four main resources that you will have to keep replenishing as far as your mobile suits and ship units go. Both units and ships only have a set amount of movement points, or fuel if you prefer, which they can spend on moving around the map. Once they run out, your advance will halt to a crawl, with the unit in question only being able to move a single tile per turn until it is resupplied. HP slash energy is another big one, since some attacks do use it as an ammo pool. Things like the GPO-2's nuke, for example. Some mobile suits and mobile armors can have up to two ammo-consuming attacks. Which might become an issue when you have something like the Zessa and your missiles run out, since at that point you're down to the beam rifle and the beam saber. Last are the supply points themselves, since that's what you'll use for field resupplies. Just like in the G-Generation games, you refill mobile suits by shoving them into the ships. Though in this case, each resupply consumes the ship's supply point resource. I brought up the two types of those a bit earlier already, so I won't be retreading it too much. The TLDR is, ships that have the first type are good for resupplying mobile suits, the ones that have the second one do a good job at repairing and refilling ships, while some outliers can do both. What this effectively means is that via these resupplies you can keep units in the fight for longer, 
and effectively double their movement range, saving you both time and money. Not to mention that you can carry spare machines along. And now for the most fun part, since, let's face it, the main appeal of this action strategy game is the combat. As an aside, you can often tap select in the startup screen to toggle between manual and automated controls for combat. Let's start with the most frequent type, unit on unit combat, which you start by moving onto a tile adjacent to the enemy unit. You use the D-pad to switch between the targets to engage, A to confirm and B to cancel. If you have your other units next to you, they will tag along to help out. After that, you get a startup screen, where you get to cycle between commands using the A and B buttons. I did translate those in the menu translation, but I'm gonna put the English names for them here on screen, just in case. Controls-wise, the D-pad is for movement. The right bumper either lets you dodge or turn on the eye field for units like the Big Zam. The left bumper lets you transform, if you're using a transformable unit, that is. And the four buttons on the right are your attacks. The X and Y buttons are your melee and primary weapons respectively, with A and B being used for the unit's other attacks. There are some that require to hold and charge the attacks, but with those you'll get a proper visual indicator in the form of an orange-ish sparkling effect, which then grows slightly bigger after a bit, indicating that the attack has charged. You can always look up what attacks a unit has by going into the production menu, picking the unit in question and tapping the left or the right bumper. The maximum amount of units you can stick on a single enemy is 6, just in case you want to know. Another type is bombardment. Ships and some units let you select the bombard option, which starts a Duck Hunt-esque combat minigame, where you try to aim and shoot down enemy units. You use the D-pad for aiming and the A button for shooting. Mobile suits and mobile armors you're shooting at will zigzag across the screen, while the ship targets will slowly move from one side of the screen to the other. HLV on transports or in the atmosphere are an exception and don't move at all, essentially making them a freebie. As a quick side note, if you are in the bombardment range of the enemy, the enemy unit will retaliate, so keep that in mind. I already mentioned that turrets can do so as well, so let's move on ahead to the third type. When attacking a ship, a base or a turret using a mobile suit and normal sized mobile armors, you start a combat minigame in a sort of a 3D-ish space, with the enemy target being all the way down and with your unit attacking from above. Just like in the case of mobile suit to mobile suit combat, you can use multiple units for attack. To be exact, the game lets you use two at a time, just have one placed on the adjacent tile to the attacking unit. As stated, you're attacking the target from above, and it's a bit evocative of Gundam's attack on the Musai in the original show. The objective is simple, shoot the enemy and in turn dodge the enemy projectiles. Regardless, let's go over the controls. The D-pad is obviously for movement letting you move up, down and sideways, with the Y and A buttons being the interchangeable fire button. Additionally, the X and B buttons let you move your firing reticle up and down. The combat sequence can be interrupted early by tapping the select button, letting your mobile suit fly off and withdraw from the encounter. Lastly, we get to death beams. I know I've brought up the colony laser earlier, but there's more in this department. The mobile suits Hyakushiki, Hyakushiki Kai, Gundam Faisalis, Dovan Wolf, Xanak, and the DLC unit Guilty can all spend 100 points of their health pools to unleash a special attack that covers multiple tiles, annihilates mobile suits and heavily damages ships. Of course, two of the game's ship type units, the Nail Argama and Kylos Kylie, can do so as well. Oh yeah, and there's also unit leveling and upgrades, but I covered that in a separate video, so all you really need to know about it in broader strokes is that more stuff your unit kills, the better it becomes at killing things. Once it has the word Ace on its status display, you can sometimes resupply it to get an upgraded form of the unit, but I digress. A large part of SD Gundam G-Next's gameplay loop is composed of getting around the four maps the game has, assuming you didn't pick scenario mode that is. Regardless, there's the main outer space map, one map each for the Moon and Earth respectively, on top of an inner space map for your Abawaku slash Garden of Horns needs. You can travel into the inner space map by moving a unit into the blue sphere at its access point, and you can exit the inner space map via traveling past the outer border of it, which automatically transports you to the access point on the main space map. As for traveling to Earth and the Moon, the ships and HLVs are capable of entering them by going into the inner blue sphere, 
Now, the catch with going into space is that you need to have an airport style, which you or your faction you're allied with owns. Moving an HLV or a ship capable of space and air travel there, upon which you can freely launch them into space. Of course, if you're launching stuff from the moon, the ships in question don't need to be capable of air travel. As a short piece of trivia, the Zeta Gundam and the DLC unit packs Sky Gundam can both enter the Earth's atmosphere without the ship, but they can't really go back up by themselves. I brought up the whole alliance forming gimmick in a previous SD Gundam GeneXt video covering the menu translation, but I'll sum it up briefly here as well. Long story short, in a game of three or more players, there is a tab in the action menu, which lets you pick a faction and form an informal alliance. You get to share your units with the guy you're allied with, and it serves as a, some sort of an informal pact, I'd say. Though at the same time, each team is in for themselves on the scoreboard, which is a thing you should keep in mind. Both as a possible victim and the perpetrator of the ensuing backstabbery. By the way, the units you get from these alliances correspond to what factions the allied team has, but at the same time it scales with your tech level. So this means that if you made an alliance with a Titans player, you're still going to need the tech level of 6 to play with the Ashmar. Just a heads up. As I brought up earlier, you can also use Allied Airports. Now for the highlight of the game. The war crimes you get to get away with. Colony drops are obviously a thing. The closed type colonies you captured can be moved bit by bit every turn towards the moon or earth to accomplish the deed. You're basically sacrificing a colony to basically nuke everything in a large radius and making it a now created field of sweltering ash hard to move across for non-airborne units. By default no player can really surrender, so it's a declaration of no quarter by default from all the participants. So there's a freebie right from the get-go. And since one of the ways you can win is by killing off the whole enemy team, it's possible to tick a few boxes there as well. Despite the fact that the flamethrowers are nowhere to be seen, you've still got nukes, you've got deployable mines, and multiple weapons that deliver a slow painful death to mobile suit pilots. Another one is treason, since the game has a way to make allies and betray them. But at the same time, on the scoreboard it's everything for themselves, so there's nobody to blame you. Capturing enemy bases with units still stationed in them lets you use those, so that could either be pinned as forcing prisoners of war to fight their own guys or stealing enemy equipment. Shooting down HLVs with mobile suits in them could also constitute a war crime, given that you're essentially killing mostly defenseless enemies. You also get to wreck supply ships which may not fully count as non-combatants or prohibited targets, but they can be if you pretend hard enough. Phew, that should do it for a comprehensive introduction to the game itself. There's obviously more that I will dig up, but that's not for today. Suffice to say, this is a game that I had a lot of fun with, and hopefully this piece does a decent job at being a starter's guide to SD Gundam G Next. As always, if you feel like it, go like, comment and subscribe. And this is Shirtlad, signing out.